BBOR, Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia at heart and from around the globe. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about a new Zodiac Killer suspect, looking at some new publications that are coming out, and a very clear narrative on how there was one single Zodiac Killer that was operating as early as 1962. And today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. Welcome to the show. How's everybody doing? I hope everyone had a good weekend. And also, thank you to everyone who has listened to some of the recent interviews that have come out on this channel. I did one interview with Melissa Rose Tappa of ZodiacKillerBomb.com, as well as talking to Ross Jirasi of Planet X Filmworks, and that came out for the Anything Goes Friday segment. We were talking about not only the Zodiac Killer, but also D.B. Cooper. You guys left a lot of good comments in the section down below, and I invite you always to give your feedback about the Zodiac, as well as any of the other true crime cases that are discussed here on Black Box Online Radio. Now, this channel is going through some changes right now. I'm doing more interviews, having more guests on the program, but I also put in a polling question where I asked people what they wanted to hear, and a lot of people said that they wanted to hear some of the older-style podcast recordings, and also, you guys have really been sending me a lot of Zodiac material, and there's lots of Zodiac killer news to discuss and respond to. So that's where we are today, but please look out for some future interviews on this channel, and feel free to hit the like button and subscribe. It really helps out Black Box Online Radio, and I'm going to get into things right now. I did a live stream last Thursday, and I was talking to you guys about all things true crime, but of course the Zodiac Killer comes up a lot. The Zodiac was a serial killer who operated in California in 1968 and 69. Whatever happened before or after that is anybody's guess. And I have to give a shout out to James, who brought up a Zodiac killer suspect to my attention, whom I wasn't familiar with, and his name is Robert Hauser. And when I first heard that name, I had to think for a second. I was like, that sounds really familiar. And what I was saying on the live stream was, I thought that he was the astronomer that had reasons for choosing certain numbers that are relevant to the Zodiac Killer's narrative. For example, the Zodiac wasn't only a serial killer, he also created the famous ciphers and cryptograms. The first cipher was the 408 cipher, and the second one was the 340 cipher. Both of these have been solved. However, the theory involving the astronomer I was thinking of was that it's related to things like asteroids, asteroid 408, asteroid 340, and that's what stood out in my mind. But I received an email from James who says, Hello, Ned. My name is James, Wine Crime Jimmy, on the forum. I hope my email finds you well. I am commenting on your video, and I had mentioned a suspect, Robert Hauser, and you thought that he was the astronomy-focused suspect, but Hauser doesn't have any known connection to astrology. And there it says astrology, but I was talking about astronomy. And he is more of an extremist person of interest. I worked with Bo Blah Blah on an overview on Hauser a couple years ago, and I wanted to share the forum link with you. We don't have definitive info on Hauser from the late 1960s, but the amount of circumstantial connections with Hauser and things we suspect about the Zodiac is astounding. From his childhood, where he supposedly saw his grandmother push his grandfather down to his death, down a set of stairs, to his high school and college years, where he was a radio and math enthusiast, to his later years, where he developed a passion for writing, letters to Bay Area publications, focused on extremist views, politics, societal issues, race, and endorsing domestic terrorism. He has just checked so many boxes. The amount of info we have been able to gather on Hauser has unfortunately come to a standstill. It doesn't seem like any other info can be gleaned at the moment, and the momentum from a couple years ago has died down on him. Would love to know your honest take on him, and here is a link with info, and would love to discuss him further. Thank you for your time and consideration, Ned, and I appreciate all the content on BBOR. Hey, James, I really appreciate you as well. And firstly, as far as the info that they have compiled, the link that James had sent me is actually an 85-point list on why Robert Hauser could be the Zodiac Killer. And this is the photo that was provided of him. It definitely appears to be one of the younger photos definitely in his younger years. And as I said, because they have so many points that they have assembled around Hauser as a Zodiac suspect, I'm going to get right to the end and look at the conclusion. And this is the end of their 85-point list on Tapa Talk. Hauser died on May 13th of 2014. He never married and never had any children. He showed up as a possible Zodiac suspect by longtime Zodiac researcher Dave Pe Peterson. He was mathematically and language inclined, an interest in space and astronomy. And to be very fair to James, I brought up that astronomical stuff that was about a different suspect and is hardly the focus of the 85-point list. He was a diver and water enthusiast, interested in history writing, anti-society, anti-police, pro-terrorism letters to the editor to get his voice heard. And when James was talking about some of these 
anti-society terrorist letters. It really was quite shocking. When I was reading that stuff about Robert Hauser, I was genuinely surprised about what I found because, firstly, he endorsed and condoned Timothy McVeigh, who committed the very famous terrorist attack and bombing, and also he also wrote a letter about calling for the hanging of William Jefferson Clinton. Yes, that's right, former President Bill Clinton. He's labeled as William Jefferson Clinton in the letter. I mean, he's openly endorsing acts of terrorism and calling for physical violence. So that stuff is no joke, and it's definitely not something that should be downplayed. He had a penchant for using unique turns of phrase and extreme violent language, a Second Amendment supporter. Now, Second Amendment supporter. The Zodiac was a serial killer who committed his crimes by gun. And I was discussing this on the most recent um, Friday episode with Ross about how the Zodiac appeared, I mean, not only appeared, the Zodiac used multiple firearms in the murders that were committed by gun. The Lake Herman Road murders was with a twenty two, and then the um the Blue Rock Springs shooting was with a nine millimeter Luger, and then even at Lake Berryessa the Zodiac is carrying a forty five, to the best of our knowledge. So this appears that he he is somebody who is changing the guns that he is using, and every crime is committed with a different gun, even the Stein murder. So it's possible that the Zodiac was a firearms enthusiast. A lot of people are very divided about this because the Zodiac committed multiple crimes by gun, as well as carrying an additional firearm at Lake Berryessa. That is the only time the victims were stabbed by knife. Some people think that the Zodiac was a firearms enthusiast, and other people think that he just decided to start changing up his weapons because... He had attributed this name to his killings. He started taking credit for the crimes, and even if even if he um, were caught in some way, he would just be like, no, I don't own a forty five or a 9mm Luger or a twenty two. It would be a way to destroy evidence because he was doing riskier behaviors. But um, in 1969, he lived in Vallejo. He lived in locations that were close to the phone booths that, where the Zodiac Killer made phone calls. He owned property in Lake Berryessa, or next to Lake Berryessa in 1969, to be fair to the statement. He scared courthouse employees so much that they shut him down. A birth father that worked in, he had a birth father that worked in theaters, giving him potential access to all sorts of film and pop culture, and the Zodiac would really talk about uh, contemporary film in 1974. Claims to have worked in broadcast radio. Birth father lived in San Francisco. An adoptive father that was a typist and stenographer. Mother was also a typist. Now, I know they have some reasons for this, in the list, but I don't think that that's a strong point anyway. Someone's a typist, or their mother's a typist, father's a typist. And even in the Myth of the Zodiac Killer documentary, they talk about how Jim Phillips Crabtree was a clerical typist, and that doesn't necessarily make somebody a serial killer. Now, here's the stuff that does make people serial killers. A rocky early home life, absolutely, that leads people to become serial killers, an uncle and aunt that were prominent in the San Francisco symp Symphony and Opera, giving him access to opera knowledge, and the Zodiac would go on to reference Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado frequently, as well as other things in literature, the previously mentioned films, comic books, all types of things from the arts, and um, at least some military training and experience, thereafter ongoing access to military bases, and possibly the PX due to the continued employment at Mare Island. So he's employed at the naval base at Mare Island. Pension for giving himself a sign-off name, Posse Comitatus. I mean, I think they're trying to say, like, attributing names and personas to himself. Had an interest in radar, particularly to honor or remember his birth father. He used to call himself Radar Sweep 47. And a radar screen bears a striking resemblance to the Zodiac Killer symbol, and indeed, it does have a circle with a cross going through it. Now, this is my first introduction to Robert Hauser. And I'm seeing a lot of signs that are very, very striking about the Zodiac Killer and other things that I'm really questioning because the Zodiac was absolutely a domestic terrorist. He threatened to detonate bombs and kill school children. He created the image of terror. And at the same time, I don't necessarily know how likely the Zodiac would have gone on to support the Oklahoma City bombing and Timothy McVeigh and something of that nature, because it seems that the Zodiac is all about himself. But that was decades later, firstly. I mean, someone can develop a more extreme ideology as time goes by. And this guy definitely seems like someone who would have had 
the brain to have been the Zodiac Killer, someone who was antisocial, and I'm sure that rocky childhood turned him into someone who's calling for the hanging of President Bill Clinton. But at the same time, I'm wondering if those actions are the type are types of domestic terrorism that would push him away from being the Zodiac, because that sounds like a much more violent and aggressive form of terrorism that the Zodiac didn't necessarily do. The Zodiac did not detonate bombs, and he even he even denied detonating bombs. He could have taken credit for the murder of Brian McDonnell at the Park Station police bombing, but he didn't do that. He said that, I hope you don't think that was me who wiped out a blue meanie with a bomb. Whereas this guy, if Robert Hauser were the Zodiac, it seems like he'd be all for that. Yep, yep, brilliant, round of applause, yes, that was me, or even if it wasn't him. He could have just said, I support those actions in their entirety, the way that he's endorsing some other terrorist events. So I'm getting a lot of mixed vibes. But overall, though, what do you think about Robert Hauser as a Zodiac killer suspect? What do you think about anything that you've heard? Geography's definitely, definitely a strong point. If he owned a place near Lake Berryessa, and he also lived near the phone booths that were used, like, perhaps after the Blue Rock Spring shooting. I know uh, when we look at a Zodiac suspect like McDuff, I've been critical of that because that appears to be the cornerstone of the theory, William McDuff Andrew, Mike Morford's suspect. And you have to have more than just living by the phone booth or owning a property near Lake Berryessa. But I think the cornerstone of this theory involving Robert Hauser is that he was antisocial, he didn't bond well with people, never married, never had any kids. So there could also be some type of sexual dysfunction in his life. I'm not saying I know that 100%, but it appears from this um, from this list of the points, which you can read for yourself at uh, tapatalk.com and find the page on Robert Hauser, that he is someone who was intelligent, but maybe a rather gifted underperformer. I mean, when we say gifted, maybe he's just a different type of underperformer, someone who's fascinated by radar and electronics and also, also fascinated with extremists, as well as becoming one himself and signing on to these acts of violence. So I think that there are several points for and several points against, and I'm going to keep looking into this suspect, but I, I'm going to withhold judgment for now other than saying that I'm curious. But my challenge question to you is, what do you think about those extremist letters that he's writing, praising Timothy McVeigh for the uh, bombing, or praise, or calling for the um, execution of President Bill Clinton? Do you think that that's stuff that the Zodiac would have gone on to do in his later life? Or do you think that that is something that is out of character for the Zodiac, because the Zodiac was more focused on himself? And as I said, we always have to give the condition that People can change over time. But I would like to read your ideas in the comment section down below. And I also want to remind you guys that you can support this program in a variety of ways. I talked about hitting the like button and subscribing, but you can also go through some of the links in the description box. And one of them is for buymeacoffee.com, buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnid88. And that allows you to make a donation or a contribution to help support the show. And anybody who makes a donation will get a shout out on Zodiac Monday. And our first shout out for today is going to come to us from Jeffrey D. Jones, who was a supporter on buymeacoffee.com. No message, but Jeff Jones, thank you so much for that. And the second one is going to come to us from Mike F., who simply says, greetings from Texas. Mike F., thank you so much. I appreciate you. And of course, we have Batman66, a very reliable supporter, and River Prawn Pottery has also become a regular and consistent supporter. And those guys are using these super thanks on YouTube. Yes, buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnet88. You can also use the super thanks on YouTube to make a donation, and even the super chats if you participate in the live streams, which are happening every Thursday. And one final announcement for the channel is that as some of you know, I'm releasing the book Killer on a White Horse, the novel that I've written in audiobook form on YouTube for free, and those episodes are going to be coming out on the weekends. Lots of content that you can check out here, as well as visiting the BBOR shorts page. But as previously stated, there is a lot to go through in this episode, and I want to give a shout out to Ross from Planet X Filmworks. As I said, I interviewed him recently, and we were talking about something that was called the One Killer Theory, and he sent me a page that was made by someone named Dion Walker that goes through the Zodiac Killer's crimes, the Lake Herman Road murders, the Blue Rock Springs shooting, and the Lake Berryessa stabbing, the Stein murder, and Dion Walker's asking a lot of challenge questions to the reader, as well as, of course, saving his judgment for the end, the way that a lot of people do, and, I mean, it's definitely a good presentation tactic. 
and one of them was, firstly, with the Lake Herman Road murders, was that really the Zodiac Killer? And I could only wonder if he had been influenced by somebody named Thomas Henry Horan, who wrote the book The Myth of the Zodiac Killer, which went on to become a Peacock documentary. And when I was reading the um, essay that had been written by Dion Walker, he was proposing three possibilities on how the Zodiac Killer might not have committed all the crimes that have been attributed to him. Of course, we have unconfirmed Zodiac activity, but with Lake Herman Road, Blue Rock Springs, Lake Berryessa, and the Stein murder, most people believe that those were committed by one person. Someone like Thomas Henry Horan would say they were committed by different people, and one person created the Zodiac Killer hoax. He wrote letters taking credit for murders that he didn't commit. And in Dion Walker's essay, The One Killer Theory, he talks about, well, how could somebody learn that information that would go into the letters? Because the Zodiac's writing letters, and even in the first letter, July 31st, 1969, the Zodiac Killer is saying, I, to prove that I committed these crimes, the Lake Herman Road murders and the Blue Rock Springs shooting, I shall state some facts that only I and the police know. Number one, what Thomas Henry Horn talks about, somebody could have been a member of law enforcement, read the police reports, and wrote letters taking credit for murders that he didn't commit. That could be something. That could be something. However, with the essay on the one killer theory, there were two other possibilities that were provided. Number one was somebody could have learned it word of mouth, not even, not even reading police reports, but they could have been told this information verbally, which could explain why certain things could be altered, certain details could be somewhat inaccurate, and maybe they're talking to a member of law enforcement, maybe they're talking to a journalist, Maybe they're just having these types of conversations. And this goes so far beyond just members of law enforcement and journalists, because I'm always reminded of the story of Roger Kibbe, the I-5 strangler, who had a brother who was part of, of, well, law enforcement, and he would learn ways to avoid the police because he would have the conversations with his brother. Now, we do see other people like Joseph D'Angelo, the Golden State Killer, who very famously was part of an anti-burglary task force, and he committed over a hundred burglaries. So, yes, there's that, someone who's doing it directly, but with Roger Kibbe, he's not the member of law enforcement. If I recall, Roger Kibbe ended up, you know, working in a furniture store, running a furniture business, actually, but he's learning the information from his brother secondhand. So could the Zodiac Killer have done that, learn information secondhand from someone in law enforcement or some journalist who had privileged information? And the third possibility, and you can take this for what you will, but visiting the crime scenes, visiting the crime scenes, and going, like, the Lake Herman Road, murder, Lake Herman Road murders were talked about in the papers. Could somebody have gone there and just kind of figured it out? how things went down. Well, to that third one, I absolutely don't think that that's true because you would need certain pieces of info that only the killer or the police would know. We're talking about things such as the girl had her feet to the west, the boy had his feet to the car, the number of shots that were fired. Yes, you could learn basic things about the um, crime scene. You might even learn where the vehicles were parked if you read things in the paper, but I don't think that that's a likely possibility. And by the end of the article, Dion Walker stated very clearly that he thinks there was one killer. It's called One Killer Theory for a reason, but he explores those possibilities. Feel free to give your comments down below. But the real reason that I was talking about this, well, the real, re real reason I'm talking to you about this is because I was having this discussion with Ross, and he brought up something about how Let's look at the unconfirmed crimes going back to 1962. Let's look at the murder of Ray Davis, which took place in Oceanside, California, in April of that year. Ray Davis was a taxi driver. And the final crime, the Zodiac committed the murder of Paul Stein. Paul Stein was also a taxi driver. And what I've always tried to get into in the past, in some way, somehow, is the full circle theory. I don't endorse or believe it myself, but just trying to make sense of it about how the final crimes mirror each other and the... F the second crime, the, late, the um, Domingo Edwards murders in 1963, is very similar to the Lake Berryessa stabbing in 1969. So there's almost this mirror effect, which I call the full circle theory. In the Domingo Edwards murders, someone blindsided Robert Domingos and Linda Edwards on a beach. The killer brought a knife, a gun, pre-cut lengths of rope, and the victims were ultimately killed by gun. But with the 
um, Lake Berryessa stabbing in 69. The killer also brought a gun, a knife, and pre-cut lengths of rope, but he was able to subdue them and just restrain them and confine them and stab them. I shouldn't say confine, just restrain them. Let's just say he restrained them, incapacitated them, and he stabbed them, stabbing Brian in the back and Cecilia in the back and the stomach. Now, is it possible that some, this is all the same killer? This is the stuff that I really wanted to explore. And to the close followers of Black Box Online Radio, you'll know that I don't endorse any of these unconfirmed events being the Zodiac. But just look at this as a theory. And this is all stuff that was shared um, by Ross and Dion Walker. I mean, this is their observation that I'm just adding some things to. Firstly, that the Zodiac commits the murder of Ray Davis in 62. The Domingo Edwards murders in 63. Maybe a crime in 64 or 66. But then the Lake Herman Road murders. Two victims are killed, David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. Then the Blue Rock Spring shooting happens, but only one victim is killed, the female victim, Darlene Farron. Then there's the Lake Berryessa stabbing. Only one victim is killed, Cecilia Shepard, the woman. And the Zodiac committed the murder of Paul Stein after Brian Hartnell had been discharged from the hospital. And he's thinking that he doesn't want to get the reputation for being a lady killer. He doesn't want to get the reputation for being somebody who is letting the men survive. So what does he do? He remembers the crime in 1962, his first murder, the murder of Ray Davis, and he remembers how easy and effective it was to murder a taxi driver. As terrible as that sounds, rest in peace to Ray Davis and Paul Stein, but the Zodiac is going to murder Paul Stein, the taxi driver, because he knows he can get away with it. He knows the male victim won't survive if he's shot point blank in the side of the head. So, that is why the Stein murder is so different than the other crimes that took place in 68 and 69. The Zodiac wanted to make sure that he had killed a male. And what do you think about that? I mean, pl please share your ideas in the comments section down below. To give my own genuine response to that, I have to point out that the Zodiac killed David Faraday at point-blank range at Lake Herman Road. But he could have done that at Lake Berryessa. Instead, he more or less just sprayed Mike Michaud with bullets. I mean, that, that word is used very frequently. He sprayed him with bullets, and he didn't even die. The Zodiac should have known that that would have been an ineffective way, or that shooting the victim at very close range would have been a more effective way to murder someone. I've never murdered anyone, but I can expect that that would have been a more effective way. I mean, people talk about this stuff all the time, and the Zodiac is always watching movies and reading comic books. He would have been aware of that. It's just common sense. Well, if it's all about making sure that he murders a male victim, or if it's about making sure that the victims are dead, he could have done that easily at Lake Berryessa. I mean, the victims were tied up. He could have stabbed them or shot them, but... He didn't do that. So is this just something that he thought about later on? Was he just expecting that the victims would die because he wasn't that good of a killer? I'm getting some mixed vibes on that as well, because look at look at how look at how the Zodiac operated allegedly in the early 1960s or the pre-Zodiac crimes, the murder of Ray Davis and the Domingo Edwards murders. All of those victims were killed. But with the Domingo Edwards murders, the killer made a pretty, pretty good um, effort to make sure that the victims were dead. And those um, those events did not happen with the Blue Rock Springs shooting or the Lake Berryessa stabbing. I also want to be fair to Dion Walker. That isn't the pure focus of this one killer theory. And I'm just going to give you guys my honest take on the subject. I completely understand that narrative about how someone committed the pre-Zodiac murders, and then they have attributed their name to a certain set of homicides, maybe for egoism, maybe for some type of self-serving reason, but then they wanted to make sure that they were known as a killer and not just someone who hated women, and that's why the Zodiac is going to go on to not only commit the murder of Paul Stein, but also do things like the bus bomb threat, and so on. So, um... I can comprehend that, but at the same time, I also notice the things that stand out against that, which I've discussed um, already, the reasons why I would think that the Zodiac wouldn't behave that way. And of course, I lean that way. And I'll say it again, I have not accepted that any of the pre-Zodiac or post-Zodiac activities outside of 68 and 69 were the same person. So I'd like to move on to the next uh, piece here on the Zodiac Killer News Report. But also, I want to remind you guys that it is October, and on Halloween, October 31st, I'll be celebrating Halloween here on this channel. There will be a live stream if the internet cooperates. I know that I come to you from West Virginia normally, but I am now in the Philippines. Let's hope the internet here in Asia is going to be... Uh, cooperating. I've been trying to do these interviews with some of the guests, and sometimes there's a little bit of trouble, but... 
I hope that everything will work on Halloween and the spirits will stay calm until Halloween night. Now, some of you saw that I released a short episode talking about a new book that is coming out from Steve Hodell. Steve Hodell is the author of the Black Dahlia Avenger series as well as Most Evil. Most Evil comes in two volumes, part one and part two. Part two is about the Zodiac Killer, and all of these books focus on Steve Hodell's father, George Hill Hodell, is not only a Black Dahlia Avenger suspect, but also a Zodiac Killer suspect. Steve Hodell is perhaps the largest believer in the Black Dahlia Zodiac connection, that the same person murdered Elizabeth Short in 1947 and then went on to murder the people in the Bay Area, as Steve Hodel at once um, attributed 25 murders to his father. But there are constantly expanding ideas that are coming from Steve Hodel. And I had the chance to correspond with him once. At first, I thought last year. Then I was like, no, wait, that was two years ago. Then I was like, no, wait, that was three years ago. All these years just start to blend into one after a while. And he told me that he was writing a book called The Early Years. And I was um, quite surprised to see Black Dahlia Avenger 4 coming out first. But um, I went over to his YouTube channel. I saw that it appears he still has some plans to release a uh, a set of books, actually, at least two books called The Early Years, which are going to talk about George Hill Hotel and his possible criminal activities prior to the murder of Elizabeth Short. But he has also made the announcement that he is releasing Black Dahlia Avenger 4, which should come out in November. And as previously stated, The Early Years will be talking about the um, crimes before the Black Dahlia murder. But when I was on Amazon.com, because I was looking at his books, I saw that one thing came up in the search results, and it was called In the Mesquite. I had not heard of this book before, but it's written by Steve Hodell. The solving of the 1938 West Texas kidnap torture murders of Hazel and Nancy Frome. Again, this is um, some new stuff for me. But I would like to uh, read the description of the book here. Retired LAPD homicide detective Steve Hodell brings over 50 years of law enforcement homicide and private investigative experience to bear on what Texas Rangers said remains the biggest unsolved mystery in the American th Southwest. In March of 1938, there was a breaking story that started out slow, announcing that a mother and daughter that were traveling in their touring car cross-country from California to the East Coast were missing on a West Texas highway. Within days came a second announcement cautioning that foul play was suspected. Next, their abandoned car was found on the fifth day of the search. The nation's worst fears were realized. In August of 2019, 81 years later, in what can be considered one of the nation's oldest cold cases, in the Mesquite carefully reconstructs the chronology of the double homicide based on original law enforcement documents, newspaper reportage, and eyewitness accounts. As silent passengers in the back seat, Hazel and Nancy Fromes were in a brand new 1937 Silver Packard Series 8 7 seater touring car. Then they were in a ride along on their journey from California to visit their daughter and sister in, on the East Coast. The identification and naming of the mother and daughter's sadistic killers and the evidence presented offering the solution will satisfy both sense and reason. Now, I am always skeptical when somebody is saying that and presenting it in a true crime book. There's a difference between, um, looking at a case that has genuinely been solved, as well as theoretical observations, but Steve Hodell has piqued my curiosity, so I will give this one a shake in the near future. But as far as the Zodiac Killer case goes, there's another thing that I would like to share with you. On the most recent Zodiac Monday, I was talking to Melissa Rose Tappa, who is the webmaster of ZodiacKillerBomb.com, and I think I can guess why she chose that name for her website. Now, Melissa Rose Tappa works with Thornton Daniel Jeffrey. They are a research team, and their Zodiac suspect is Loring Dale Hill, L.D. Hill, and he was the subject of last week's episode. Now, I did some follow-up notes on the most recent live stream, which came out on Thursday, but there was one note about L.D. Hill that I did not remember to say, and I want to share that with you right now. Well, Melissa Rose Tappa has the unique observation that the Zodiac Killer talked about detonating a bomb, but she does not believe that he was referring to a physical bomb. She believes that the bomb was actually the Zodiac Killer himself, and he was talking about going on a kill rampage. Now, this is one where I can see evidence for and evidence against once again, but let's, let's go through it right now. Number one, there is a certain amount of challenge that we have to give to that idea. Firstly, the Zodiac Killer talked very clearly about a physical bomb. He said that he was going to detonate a physical bomb. He said that it was buried in the ground. You have until the fall to dig it up. He drew out bomb diagrams. All of that suggests a physical bomb, not referring to himself as the bomb. But on the other hand, I have said louder than anyone, 
I don't believe the Zodiac's bomb threats. I never thought there was a real bomb. I have been very clear that he didn't follow through on it. I think that he just made it up to scare people. And people do things like that. They don't always tell the truth, especially when you're a psychopathic serial killer. But also, I am familiar with the expression in the English language. Have you not heard that before? Someone refers to themselves as a bomb, or somebody refers to themselves as a time bomb, perhaps. I even knew one guy that got a tattoo of a time bomb once because he said, Oh, last year I almost blew up. That is something that we do say in the English language. And as of now, I have to side with the former, and that... The Zodiac was indeed talking about a physical bomb for the following reason. For the following reason, if the Zodiac wanted to just go on some type of kill rampage, why did he use that type of language in the 1969 letter when he threatened to go on a quote-unquote kill rampage? Wouldn't he just say that? Or did he concoct some type of plan to confuse the authorities? I mean, it makes sense in some ways, but I would have to side with the former once again. But that's another thing that I would like to ask you guys. What do you think about the Zodiac Killer referring to the bomb, but he actually just is referring to himself, meaning that he's going to explode and do some murderous activity? So, I mean, I would like to know your ideas in the comment section down below. And if you'd like to hear more about Melissa Suspect L.D. Hill, you can visit ZodiacKillerBomb.com. She also runs the Facebook group, The Zodiac Killer and Me. And before I move on to the next segment, I would like to say a final note about Steve Hodel and his um, Black Dahlia Avenger series. Firstly, a lot of people are very critical of Steve Hodel because they don't believe that his father was the Zodiac. I also don't believe that his father was the Zodiac. But as far as the Black Dahlia Avenger material is concerned, I think that there's a very high chance that George Hodel was the Black Dahlia Avenger and that he committed the murder of Elizabeth Short. So to give credit where credit is due. And the next piece that I would like to look at is something that was written by Mike Rodelli, available on Facebook. But Mike Rodelli also has his website, MikeRodelli.com, and it talks about his Zodiac suspect, Shel Cavale. Shel Cavale was an auto executive, perhaps one of the wealthiest Zodiac killer suspects. He's also the subject of the book Lunches with Mr. Q by Kevin Nelson. And Mike Rodelli has written something out here that says, My suspect, Shel Cavale, helps people better understand what happened and why in the case. This is what they mean. Number one, Shel Cavalli explains the Presidio Heights murder scene and sees familiarity with Presidio Heights, an obscure area of San Francisco. The Berryessa attack near Oakville, where Shel Cavalli had a horse ranch and which lies between Lake Berryessa and Napa. Blue Rock Springs was near the golf course, and Lake Herman Road was on the back roads, where Shel Cavalli drove his British sports cars as far back as 1948, and Mount Diablo is very clearly visible through a tunnel at this site, and also Lake Herman Road is ties into a sister city a relationship between Trondheim and what he thought at the time was a murder site in Vallejo. It's interesting that he says that because in Mike Rodelli's own book, The Hunt for Zodiac, he talks about how Lake Herman Road actually took place on unincorporated land. But what I mean, I think he means is that the Zodiac allegedly probably thought that was Vallejo in this hypothesis, and Trondheim is the sister city of Vallejo, surprisingly. In number two, this explains the Z's slow manner of speaking. Shel Cavalli was described as having a, a slow manner of speaking in articles from 1958 and 87. Number three, explains the San Francisco Police Department sketch, a dead ringer for the 1969 photo of Shel Cavalli, and that frightened Lindsay Robbins when he helped make the first sketch. Number four, it explains monarch-sized paper, which Shel Cavalli used to write to Mike Rodelli, which is referred to as rich people's stationery by Superior Court Judge Eric Oldall, who had never seen a parole request letter from an inmate written on such stationery. Number five, it explains British references. Shel Cavalli had lifelong ties to the UK, and I think that means the stuff like Happy Christmas. The Zodiac didn't say Merry Christmas, he wrote Happy Christmas. Number six, explains the dates of murders. Shel Cavale's mother died on December 20th, the date of the Lake Herman Road murders. Shel Cavale's father was born on September 27th, the date of the Lake Berryessa stabbing. And no matter what, no matter what, we have to look at this question of why the Zodiac chose to operate on the dates that he chose. And to the credit of Mike Rodelli, that's a strong find. I know a lot of people don't think that Shel Cavale was the Zodiac killer, but... That is a strong find, the way that this is matching up. And about the material, you know, they, he um, he owns a place that is near the um, Lake Herman Road murders, or um, let, let me get that exact uh, that exact quotation right, that he, um, he has the horse ranch 
that was between Lake Berryessa and Napa. So I wanted to get that. And he used Lake Herman Road Murders to drive his British sports cars, and he'd been doing that for years. Well, think about what I said at the beginning involving Robert Hauser and how, you know, he owns property that is also near the crime scenes and he lives near one of the crime scenes. Countless people in the Vallejo area are going to have that. And if anything, that's a strike against both of them, against Robert Hauser and Shell Cavalli, because it's just ordinary material. And you're going to need something that's a lot stronger than that. Say, for example, though, I mean, I've, I've been talking to you guys about the Zodiac suspect, John Parr Cox, on this channel. He also lived in Presidio Heights, near the near the Stein murder, very close to the Stein murder, actually. So you need something a little bit more than that. But this is perhaps the most fascinating about thing about Shell Cavalli ever, that on July 5th, Shell Cavalli experienced a UFO sighting, and Blue Rock Springs took place just after midnight on July 5th, and the phone call, and of course, um, that took place on July 5th, I'll give him that though, but it's possible the shooting took place on July 4th, so, but yeah, Shell Cavalli's UFO sighting is something that I've been meaning to discuss in greater detail. Now, Number seven is that explains the Zodiac Killer's ability to manipulate the media. See the book Lunches with Mr. Q, a care feeding of the media section in the book. In 1947, he had the Flying Saucer incident, and he also manipulated the media coverage. Number eight, the sister cities between Trondheim and Vallejo explain why the Zodiac committed crimes in Vallejo, even though he lived in San Francisco. Ah, now, Mike Rodelli, I have to challenge you on that one. The Zodiac Killer did not live in San Francisco by everybody's standards. Some people just think that he live there. You might be one of them, but that is not an established fact. I mean, I completely get the narrative. I think this would be a stronger point if he were just to say that the Zodiac talks about Vallejo all the time. He even wrote Vallejo on the car door at Lake Barriesa when he didn't have to. He didn't mention Benicia, though, and he didn't say things like Solano County or something like that, or Napa County. I mean, maybe he... I'm trying to think if he ever used that word in something, or I'm thinking of something else. But the Zodiac talked about Vallejo. He said he had good times in Vallejo. Now, if he were just to focus on the Zodiac's frequent use of the name Vallejo, because it was a sister city to Trondheim in Norway, and Shulkavale was Norwegian, that would be something... But it explains the reddish hair description and reddish brown hair behind the stamp. Shulkavale had reddish brown hair. Okay, I mean... That's Mike Majot's describe, description of the Zodiac, maybe reddish-brown curls. Number 10, it explains the circle cross symbol and other Norse references, and the Norse runes, and Seuss, and Lagus, and slaves in the afterlife. Shulkavali was born in Norway and lived there for 10 years, and this, um, I guess, is maybe saying, I'll be born, reborn in paradise, and those whom I have killed will be my slaves, is something the Zodiac said, and Mike Rodelli is proposing that that's of Norse, uh, of Norse um, heritage. Number 11 explains why the Zodiac was obsessed with cars, school buses, and motorcycles, and Shulkavale had a lifelong association with cars. No, I've always said that's a strong point in Brodelli's case. That's one of the few consistencies in the Zodiac mystery. Number 13 explains the military look at Lake Berryessa and the Wing Walkers. Shulkavale was a naval pilot in World War II. Number 14 explains the use of term road races in the Stein letter, and Shulkavale also used the term road races in his book I Never Look Back. Number 15 explains lapel pins and references. Shulkavale did that, had it in a photo with Silky Sullivan. I can't comment on that one. Number 16, it explains that the Zodiac's obsession with Riverside. Shulkavale was there for the weekend for the LA Times Grand Prix. Number 17, it explains why the Zodiac killer wrote a letter to the lawyer Melvin, Melvin Belli. He ran in the same social circles, and Belli went to a fair with his brother Ragnar as part of the article. Okay, I can't comment on that one either, but I think you're getting the idea that he's in the same social circles as Shel Cavale. It explains why the Zodiac Killer wrote Peekaboo on the Halloween card. It explains possible Peekaboo Pennington reference, which was rich and powerful and apparently had a wandering eye. And the Zodiac Killer sent a Halloween card on October 27th of 1970 that had lots of floating eyes. Number 19 explains why the murder at Blue Rock Springs took place near a golf course. Shulkavale was an extremely avid golfer. Number 20, it explains the reference to Mount Diablo on June 26th of 1970. Shulkavale had a hill climb race that same date in 1949, June 26, 1949. And the fact that the Lake Herman Road scene is when you look south virtually, all you see is Mount Diablo. This is a relationship to Mount Diablo that may clue into Shulkavale's identity. That stuff I'm not too impressed uh, with because on June 26th of 1949, and that's what the Zodiac Killer is trying to bring in something, what is it, uh, what is it, 19 years later? That's why 
the Zodiac is going to be uh, remembering that. Well, you know, I guess I uh, guess 19 years later, uh, I, I I did say something about Mount Diablo. I was there 19 years before, so uh, I, I guess that's, that's a good opportunity. I'm going to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm definitely not convinced by that. It explains the use of Washington and Maple Streets live nearby. The Zodiac uh, talked about this in a letter. Originally, the Zodiac killer was supposed to drive Paul Stein, the final victim. <laughs> well, Paul Stein's supposed to drive the Zodiac to Washington and Maple, then goes to Washington and Cherry. Familiarity with Presidio Heights. And we have just uh, two more. Number 22, it explains the Zodiac's ability to capture details in his letters the night of the Stein murder and include them in multiple letters because he became the only known suspect to have been spoken to by an officer. Ah, now wait a second. That again is not an established fact. Shelkovale firstly denied that completely, that he ever, um, well, that he spoke to anyone on the night of, or that someone came out and talked to him. Shelkovale's response was, he was questioned about this years later and said that he was in London at the time, but, um, that's uh, just the ultimately end ending response. And number 23, it explains why the Zodiac Killer drove, seems to have chased a British sports car driven by a young man at Lake Herman Road an hour and three quarters of an hour before the Jensen and Verde shooting. That, of course, is talking about the William Crow incident. William Crow was a witness at Lake Herman Road who says that somebody in was uh, chasing him, and William Crow had the sports car, but the sports car, I believe, is actually owned by his girlfriend, and the um, girlfriend's father had purchased it, and he went, he got out of the parking lot, got out of the car in the parking lot to tinker with the motor, and that he was trying to alter some things, and then the suspicious vehicle came in. But the challenge to that one is that William Crow would alter his testimony. Originally, he said that there were two Caucasian males sitting in a sitting in a vehicle that was following him, and he couldn't make out any discernible facial features. Then he changed it to say that he was um, being followed by a single man who resembled the Zodiac Killer's composite sketch. So that's actually a strike against um, this list here. But those are 23 reasons why Mike Rodelli thinks that Shel Cavalli was the Zodiac Killer. Please feel free to weigh in on that. And as you see, some I agree with, some I don't. But I'd love to know your thoughts on the subject. Also, you can visit some of the links in the description box. And that will be all for me now. I will see you over on Instagram. But you guys can also write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. Please look out for more interviews in the future. And also Serial Killer Tuesday will come out tomorrow. So everybody take care and goodbye.